It's from Psalm chapter 22, verses 22 through 26. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the sufferings of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Amen. Joy to the name. 
Thank you so much for dying on the cross to break the power of sin in our lives, that we may no longer be slaves, but we may be set free by you. Thank you for rising from the dead, that we may have new life in you. It's that power of the risen Christ in us that enables us to change and become more and more like you. And that's our goal, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, just as you did, Lord Jesus. So during this service, Lord, accept our praise and work in our hearts as we hear your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Please be seated. You know how a lot of times it seems like, oh, you get bad news. You know, this person had cancer, this person's going through this or that. But we've had an, some answers to prayer lately. And one of those is Bryce Ringsby. And he's going to come and he's going to share the miracle that God did in, in, in bringing healing to his body. And this is his wife, Sandy. Most of you know them, but some of you might not. Bryce and Sandy Ringsby. Uh, two months ago, um, I went in for a colonoscopy. And uh, besides checking the lower end, they checked the top end. And uh, the doctor was very concerned afterwards. He shared with me and showed Sandy the picture that they'd taken down in my throat. And I had, he called it a polyp on my vocal cord. Of course, my speech therapist's wife had to correct him when we got home, or correct what he said. It's called a vocal nodule when it's on your vocal cord, not a polyp. Well, either one. <laughs> but anyway, make a long story short, Sandy was very concerned because it was very big. She said that she had seen lots of pictures of him when she studied about all of that, and she was amazed how big it was. Well, the throat specialist I saw a week later, they scheduled me to see a throat specialist, put a line down there to look at it, and she was very concerned about the size of it. And uh, I was not happy with her news, saying that I had to be on vocal rest. And I said, well, hey, I have a job working with special needs adults, a day program. It requires a lot of instruction, directing them all day long and talking. She goes, I don't care. You need to limit your talking to as little as possible. That included when I, she asked me what other things I did. And for bus duty for my job in the afternoons, I had to yell out 70 names in the afternoon to come get on the bus. She thought that helped create it. And she said, no more of that. Get somebody else to do it. So anyway, and then she put me on a prescription medication that my wife also had to take already for uh, re acid reflex. And I told her, I don't have that. She goes, well, maybe it'll help get it smaller. So just give it a try, you know? Because I told her, I know what it is. I know what acid reflex is, and I don't have it. So she said, just go ahead and take it. Let's see if it'll help some. She goes, I want to see in 30 days. So I went back from my appointment. And she put the line down again and had the little camera looking. And I wish I'd had a camera to take a picture of her face because she couldn't find anything. Oh. And my explanation to her was, well, I said the previous Sunday morning, this was a week ago Wednesday, I told her, I said, I had a couple ladies come up to me in church and say that a lot of people have been praying for me. And they believe that I was healed. And I said, there's your answer. And she goes, well, there's no other explanation. I have no other explanation, she said, because I've never seen one that large disappear like that. Hallelujah. And she's seen a lot of them, she said. So it also gave me an opportunity to witness even more to her. Uh, when I told her last year when I went to the hospital, uh, after having the flu for a week, a lot of you already know about this, but some of you don't. And... Uh, my sodium level was dangerously low, it was at 102. And I went into the ICU for two days, and my wife told me, once I got out of ICU after three days, she told me, she said, Bryce, the doctor told me that following, you went on Saturday night, that Sunday morning, that he had never seen anybody with their sodium level that low, and they were still alive. So I was able to tell her the bigger miracle, even than the polyp disappearing, was that I'm even here, I shouldn't be here. 
But I thank God that it's the power of prayer. I know that. There were so many people from our church, other people that knew us, that were praying for me when I was in that hospital for that week, and also praying for me about the vocal nodule. But uh, two weeks after I did rehab, before I could go back to work, I saw a neurologist, and he's looking at my brain scan from when I went in and I had all these problems going on. I had a, a regular heartbeat. I mean, I had so many bad things going on. And he just was so amazed. He says, Bryce, you should have had a stroke when that sodium level was that low. He said, you should have had a seizure. You should have had brain damage. You should have gone home with brain damage. And I was able to witness to the neurologist, too. And I said, I know it's God's power of prayer that healed me. And while I didn't go home with any of that damage. So I praise God. For all of your prayers uh, over both of those things, and I just praise Him for for the prayer of God's the prayers of God's family because I know there's power in prayer. Amen. Amen. are going to come forward and, and we're going to give up our tithes and our offering. And we're going to sing a song called I Know Whom I Have Believed. And in this, this song, uh, the words for this song, I, I had uh, always associated this song with the words of William Carey, the great missionary to India, who ministered for seven years before he had his first convert. But when he died, there were over 100,000 uh, Indian Christians through the ministry that he started. Talk about perseverance. And before he died, he said, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. It wasn't till later that in reading through the Bible that I realized that the Apostle Paul was the first one who said that when he was facing his death. And so that's our testimony. Praise God. The one we believe in is the one who heals, the one who sustains. And we're going to sing uh, and praise God as we give of our tithes and offering. Let me bless the offering. Lord, our every breath comes from you. You created us. You have a plan for, uh, a wonderful plan for each person here. Help us to follow that plan. And until our dying breath, we want to serve you. So Lord, give us strength, give us health, provide for our needs. And help us to see your way and follow your way in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Pastor Luke's going to be preaching today, and you have a kid's message, right? Kids, come on up for a kid's message with Pastor Luke. everyone. How are you doing? Good. Oh, we're sleepy this morning. Everybody's asleep. How are you doing? Good. Oh, I've got two. Good. Good. Okay. 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 There's some more people doing good. I got a question for you. Uh, how many of you, your parents give you directions sometimes? They ask you to do things. All the time. All the time? Yeah. All the time. Right? Yeah. Do your parents ever ask you to do things? What happens if one of your parents asks you to do something and you forget what they said? You go ask them again. That's good. What if you just forget that they asked you to do anything at all and you just go play? You get in trouble. You get in trouble? Yeah. You might get grounded, right? Yeah. Okay. I got to tell you something. When I was little, littler than you guys, I was not very good at paying attention to what my parents had to say. And when my mom asked me to do something, she knew that she could say it over and over and over again, and I still wouldn't remember unless she took her hands and she put them right on the sides of my face like this. Sorry, like this. She'd take her hands and she'd put them right next to my eyes like this so I couldn't see anything but her. And I couldn't get distracted by anything. See that? And then she'd tell me what she wanted me to do. And as I got a little bit older, I learned. She'd say, Luke, I have a job for you. And I'd take my own hands and I'd put them up here next to my eyes. Just like she did. So I was focused. I was focused on what she had to say. And then I wouldn't forget because I couldn't get distracted. You know, in the Bible, God asks us to do things. And Jesus has very important words for us. Did you know that? He does in the Bible. What are some things that Jesus asks us to do? What? Pray. To pray, yeah. What else? Uh huh. To don't do sins. To not sin, that's right. Yeah? Worship. To worship God? That's right. What else? Yeah? To obey His commandments. To obey His commandments. That's true. Yes? Love. To love. Yes, we have to love everyone, right? Those are some really good examples. What happens if God asks us to love people and we forget? What happens? What? Well, we're not going to get grounded, right? God doesn't usually ground us. At least, I, I, God has never grounded me. But the things that he asks us to do are really important. Like if he asks us to treat our friends with love and we forget, we might act selfish. We might even get in a fight. And our friends might be upset with us because we didn't act kindly. Right? It's not the same as being grounded, but it's not a very good thing that happens. So it's very important. Whenever you're praying, whenever you're hearing the Bible, to make sure and have yourself focused on what God is saying. Right? Focused. Okay? So if you go to children's church now, make sure you focus on what they're teaching you, okay? Because you don't want to forget what God has to say to you. That's all. Thank you, guys. You can go to Children's Church now, or you can go back and sit with your families. Um, 
true story. Okay. Just a, sorry, just a sec here. Left something. Focused, right? Okay. Um, this morning, we're going to be looking at and talking about a few verses from the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, if you've been here on a Sunday in the last couple weeks, then you probably know that we've, uh, we've started working our way through the book of Hebrews front to back. Um, and it's kind of a slow process at the beginning of Hebrews because every two or three verses you could preach two or three sermons on. Uh, but as Pastor Brock said the other day, Hebrews is front-loaded. The first half is really dense. And then we start to move through it a little bit more easily. Um, so today we're looking at chapter 2 in the book of Hebrews. And we're just going to look at the first four verses. Uh, so please turn with me in your Bibles or in the Bibles you find in the seats around you to Hebrews chapter 2. I have the Brown Pew Bible, and in this Bible it's on page 889. And we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Okay, we're going to start reading in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. It says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore. Whoop. We're going to stop. We hit a therefore. Uh, therefore is a very dangerous thing if you read therefore in the scripture and keep going without figuring out why it's there. Because therefore tells us that whatever they're about to say, it's based on what they just said. Right? So as a brief overview for the, what we looked at the last couple of weeks, chapter 1 of Hebrews focuses on who Jesus is. It especially focuses on the fact that Jesus is higher than the angels because he was not just a human, he was also completely God. Uh, to some of us who've been Christians for a while, that might seem pretty obvious. It might seem pretty elementary because if you've been in the church for a long time, you've been hearing and probably believing that Jesus was both fully human and fully God for a long time. Uh, but it's not that obvious to all of us. And I would, I would say it wasn't that obvious to all of the early Christians because they knew Jesus was a human. But angels are spiritual beings. There's something else. There's something different. And they had to accept, just as we do, that Jesus was not only human. He was also completely God in order to accept that Jesus was higher in level than the angels. His power is higher. His ability is higher. His majesty is higher. He's God himself. Uh, so that's chapter one. And what we read today is based on that. Okay, now we can read past the therefore. Let's start over in verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Okay, so we're going to take this short section of scripture and unpack it, as Brock says, like we're unpacking a suitcase. We need to see what it means so before we can apply it to our lives. And it's a dense few verses. So we're going to start just one verse at a time. And verse 1 says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. And the first thing I notice about this is that it's a warning. You know, you want to pay attention to warnings more possibly than other things you hear because they're a sign of danger ahead. You know, when you're driving down the road, signs that are white might tell you important information like the speed limit. Uh, 
And signs that are green might tell you interesting information like that there's a gas station at the next exit. But if there's a big yellow diamond, you better figure out what it says. Right? It's warning you of some danger. Either there's a tricky turn ahead or something of that nature. Um, this is a warning. And specifically, it's a warning to Christians. This warning is to people who've already recognized that they've done things that are wrong and that they cannot earn their way out of the consequences of those choices. This is a warning to people who've already accepted that they need forgiveness from God and that they need to follow Jesus' instruction in life if they want to live a life of love and joy and peace. Uh, that's who this warning is for. And it's a warning that Christians pay close attention to what they've heard, specifically about Jesus, so that they don't drift away. Now, I don't understand Greek. Not any Greek at all. Not current Greek, not ancient Greek. I certainly don't know how to read the Greek scriptures. But this was originally written in Greek. And I've read from some very wise guys and ladies who do understand Greek that this verb for drift is the same word they would use for to slip as if a ring were to slip off a finger while you were walking. This verb for drift, when it says, be careful that you don't drift away, it's talking about something that happens accidentally and through negligence. It's not saying, be careful that you don't suddenly turn on Jesus and denounce God. And it's not saying, be careful that you don't uh, suddenly have an overwhelming desire to kill people and commit great and heinous sins. It's saying, be careful that you don't drift away from God by not paying close attention to the message that we've received from Jesus because it can happen. Specifically, what we need to do to live the kind of life that Jesus asked for us is to keep the word of the Lord fresh inside of us. In the Catholic Church, they have this practice every time they read a scripture from one of the Gospels, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They do this. They draw a little cross on their head, and on their mouth, and on their heart. And if they remember what they've been taught, they know that that symbol is actually a prayer. And it's a prayer that means, may the word of the Lord be on my mind. May the word of the Lord be on my mouth. May the word of the Lord stay in my heart. And that needs to be all of our prayer. The warning is to Christians. Pay close attention to what you've heard so that you don't drift away. Okay, let's keep reading. In the second verse, it says, For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Okay, a little bit of background knowledge that uh, Pastor Brock went into a previous week is that the uh, Jews believe and teach that the first five books of the Bible, they're also the first five books of the Jewish scriptures, were written down by Moses. And just like all scripture, they were inspired by God. And the Jewish rabbis teach that the way God worked through Moses was he sent angels with his message to tell Moses what to write. So those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we kind of refer to them as a group as the law. And they contain God's instructions to his people thousands of years ago before Jesus was even in the picture as far as us humans knew. His instructions to his people on how to live, what to do, what not to do, and what will happen if you don't live this way. That's in the law. That's the message that was brought by angels. So here in Hebrews it's saying, if the message that was brought by angels had to be obeyed, and if you didn't obey it, there were consequences. How much more important is it that we obey a message that's been brought by Jesus, who is so vastly far above the angels? He's God himself. If God has a message so important 
that instead of sending angels, he came himself and became a human being so he could communicate it to us through his life. Imagine the consequence and the side effect of ignoring that message. So verse 2 says, For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Now that phrase, such a great salvation, that says an awful lot all by itself. To describe the message of Jesus as a great salvation you see, we, we've got these two messages we're comparing. And the first message, angels were sent as messengers to bring it. And the message was a message of law. It was a message of rules. Now, God communicated those rules for the good of the people who followed him. Because he knows the best way to live that will result in love and joy and peace. But it was still a message of rules. And it was a burden. And still is, if you try and earn your salvation that way, it's a burden. The second message was brought by God himself in the person of Jesus. And it's a message of salvation. Jesus does tell us how to live, but the core of the message is not the rules. The core of the message is salvation. So we have to ask ourselves, what is this great salvation? Well, it doesn't talk about it right here. But we know from the rest of the teaching of Jesus and from the other scriptures, especially in the New Testament, that the good news, the great salvation, is that God is establishing and has established a kingdom here on earth over which we don't elect other human beings who are just as faulty as we are to rule. God himself is the ruler. And that kingdom, he's not establishing it by making war against nations. He's establishing it by making war against Satan. And the members of that kingdom are not the people who live in any particular place. They're the people who are willing to accept Jesus as the Lord and leader of their life. They're the people who are willing to admit that they've done wrong and accept Jesus' forgiveness and live the way that Jesus asked them to live. Those are the members of the kingdom. And in anyone who's willing to do that, Jesus will conquer Satan in their lives. That's the great salvation message. And not only that, it plays into all of our lives because all of our lives are different in a little bit of a different way. For anyone who's been so hurt that their hearts are covered with calluses and they can't feel anymore, the good news is Jesus will give us a new heart. He'll soften our hearts with his love and teach us how to love ourselves and love others again in an appropriate way. For anyone who's become a slave to their own sinful and destructive choices, the good news is that Jesus sets us free. He gives us a new life. He gives us our free will back that's been taken away by our habits. For everyone who's been flattened under the weight of depression or anxiety or hopelessness, he will fill them with hope. For those who are poor and in need, the good news is that Jesus will provide for your needs. And usually he does that by sending other people to carry his love to you by their actions. And the people group he sent is the church. It's the people of the kingdom. To the sick, the good news is that Jesus has the power to heal. And if you're sick, there's only two possible things that could happen if you're a part of God's kingdom. One, you're going to be healed in this body. Two, it's also possible that this body you're in might die. And if you are part of Jesus' kingdom, the next thing that will happen is you will be in his presence in a new body that doesn't experience pain and never gets old. And you will be in the presence of God. Those are the only two ways it could go. That's the good news. That's the great salvation that Jesus came to earth to bring to us. And 
first two of Hebrews 2 says, the message brought by angels was binding. We had to obey it because there were consequences. Imagine the consequences of ignoring such a great salvation that we've been offered. The offer is made to each of us. That good news is for all of us. So what's the consequence of ignoring it? Well, the people of Jesus' kingdom are not a people that live in a certain place. They're the people that have accepted him as Lord. If you haven't accepted him, you're not in the kingdom. Those blessings are not yet yours. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of freedom, and you cannot be dragged or forced into it. You have to accept it, or it wouldn't be so free. If we don't keep the words of Jesus fresh in our minds and on our lips and in our hearts, I think we run the risk of falling away from that great salvation. And not because we decided to turn on God, necessarily, but just through neglect. All right, so if that much is true, if the stakes are that high, we need something, we need a tool, we need a method of discerning whether we are staying close to the message of Jesus or whether we're running the risk of falling away. We're going to read a couple more verses here from Hebrews 2. And they describe the way that early Christians could tell that the message they'd received from preachers and apostles was the true message of Jesus. And I think that that method is the same skill we have to determine whether we are living out the message of Jesus in our lives. Now, just because it's such a short section, I'm going to start over at Hebrews 2, verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 4. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Okay, let's unpack these last two verses. The true message, the good news was first brought to us by Jesus. After Jesus died on the cross and appeared to many of his followers so that they would know he'd risen from the dead and conquered death, he ascended into heaven. And the last instruction that he gave his followers before he went up into heaven is found at the very end of the book of Matthew. And this is what he told them to do. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He instructed them to take that message that he had brought and continue carrying it out to the world. So here in Hebrews... The writer of Hebrews acknowledges that even though at this point in time, Jesus was already ascended into heaven, he wasn't still preaching in the body. He acknowledged that they heard the message from people who were there firsthand as Jesus taught. They got it just secondhand. A lot closer than we are from it, isn't it? But we have this written word here. Jesus didn't write it down himself with a pen, but we get it secondhand from witnesses. And not only that, but God testifies to the fact that what these men and women said are true and right. And how did he testify to it? By signs, wonders, and various miracles 
and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Those first preachers and apostles, they were given by God the ability to do amazing things. They were given by God the ability to perform miracles, to heal the sick, to cast out demons by the power of God. And the reason for those miracles was so that people would know God is present with these men and women. They didn't make this up. It isn't a plot. God is present because people can't do this sort of thing. And here in Hebrews, it describes those actions with three words. First is signs. Because they weren't just nice shows of power. Check out what I can do. They were signs. They pointed people to the fact that God was present. And the message was his message. <coughs> and the second is wonders because nobody can explain how they happened. Nobody can explain how that happened except that God was there. And the third is miracles, which literally means mighty acts. Because Peter and Paul and the other apostles, they didn't have the ability to perform healing. They didn't have the ability to cast out demons on their own. They needed somebody mightier with them, somebody with ability and strength in the spiritual realm to do those things, or they couldn't have done it. So because these actions were signs, wonders, and miraculous actions, the people knew for sure, God is here. And it also says, gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For everyone who accepted the message that the apostles taught, the message that God came to earth to bring, God put his spirit within them. When they chose to believe and accept Jesus as their Lord, his spirit was within them. And it testified inside them, you got it right. You got it right. I'm with you now. I've been tugging at your heart all along, but now I'm with you and inside of you because you allow me to be. These are the proofs that the early Christians had that the message they believed was the true message, the message that God came to earth himself to bring. And I believe that they are also the scale God has given us to determine whether we are living close to that message and not running the risk of falling away. We heard from a man this morning who's been miraculously healed twice, at least, just this year. And he's not the only one. Bryce is here this morning because of something wondrous that happened. Twice! Something miraculous that a doctor could not have done. That Bryce could not have done. That none of us could have done. Only God could pull it off. Amen. Amen. And I believe this morning that not only were they wonders and miracles, they were signs. They're here to point us to the fact that God is alive and active. Yeah. Yeah. He's here with us this morning. If you've accepted him as your Lord, he's active in your life. Believing is not just something you do with your brain. You make a decision with your will and God comes inside of you. Now, you might be saying, that sounds really exciting, Luke, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it happen. Or maybe I used to feel God's presence, and I haven't for a while, and I believe, but I don't feel it. What's going on? If this is true, what am I missing? Well, I'm going to be kind of bold here and suggest that I can think of two things that might be going on. There might be more than two reasons. I can think of two. The first is, it's highly likely that many of us living in this very mundane world and dealing with mundane challenges every day and every week, we forget to look for amazing things. We forget to look for miracles. 
Do you know there are people in this church community who are meeting Jesus for the first time? There are people in this church community who are growing and who are becoming more like Jesus Christ himself and less like their old selves because of the Holy Spirit. They're overcoming challenges that they could never overcome before because of the Holy Spirit. Do you know there are families in this church that are becoming gradually more and more described by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Where those things didn't come into the picture in that family very often before. It's happening here. If those are not miracles, I don't know what are. You know what that list is called? We call it the fruit of the Spirit. Because we can't take our lives that are messy and our characters that are selfish and our families that are often become places of pain because of that mess and that selfishness. We can't take that and change it without the Spirit of God. Yeah. It's possible that by living in this mundane world and dealing with mundane challenges, we forget to look for miracles. Christian, the Holy Spirit who forgave you for your sins is alive and active. Open your eyes. The second thing I can think of that might be going on, and this is frightening, is that we might be drifting away from the message that God came to earth to bring us. And the message of God is more than just something we understand with our brains and hear with our ears. Jesus didn't just come in the clouds and declare something loudly so the people would hear it. He was born as a human and lived a life. And he died a death. The message of Jesus is something we also do. We live it out. If you don't see the Spirit in your life, Christian, be bold and humble and ask the Lord, am I living the message that you've brought? Am I living the message that you came yourself to bring so that I would know, so that I could live a life that's full of love and joy and peace? and see that change happening in other people too. I'm going to call the worship team up and they're going to close with a song. And Pastor Brock will lead us in prayer. And as we pray, I challenge you to come before the Lord boldly and humbly because it takes both of those things And ask the Lord, if you don't see the Spirit moving in your life, to help open your eyes. Because, man, it's encouraging to see it going on. It's encouraging to see God changing lives. It can give you strength. And come before the Lord boldly and humbly. And be willing to ask God with me, am I living out the message that you brought Am I neglecting it in some way? Don't drift away. This morning is a lot like every other morning in some ways because God is here with us, and that's true every day. But if today you come before the Lord and say, draw me closer, don't let me drift away. I'm willing to work on it. I'm willing to change more than I've changed so far. Then it might be different than every other morning. Please stand with us as we sing. As we sing, if you'd like to gather at the uh, altar here, you're welcome to do that. That's an act of humility before the Lord. And uh, if you feel God speaking to you and you'd like to gather here at the altar for prayer, feel free to do that as we sing.
washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of God speak speaking to me while Luke was uh, speaking. I think there's some unfinished business here today. I don't think these folks here at the altar represent what needs to be done today. And so, and I know there's not room here for what needs to be done. What I would like for us to do is just where you're at, sit or kneel, and let's just take a little bit of time. Now for some of you, there's relationships that need to be healed. I saw God work in a miraculous way yesterday, helping to heal relationship, and I can't talk about it, but I'm just saying that there's incredible things happening. I've heard of two or three people healed, physically healed, in the last few weeks. I've seen people coming to Christ and growing like what he's saying. And I'm, I'm privileged because I'm in a position or we're in positions as pastors where we kind of get a, a see of what God's doing. But I know that in this place that perhaps almost every one of us has either somebody on our heart or something happening in us that we really need God to work. And maybe even it's in us. There's something that we just need to turn over to the Lord. And so, where you're at, if you feel like, it, if you, feel like you wanna leave, you go ahead and, and, and leave right now, but if, if you feel like that there's some business for God to take care of, something on your heart, let's just take a bit of time here to just, where we're at, just sit down and pray. And it isn't the pastor, it's not the pastor or leaders of the church that can do what needs to be done. It's God himself. So pray to God himself and say, Lord, by faith, I'm putting this in your hands. Let's just take a moment of time to just pray. And Jane, you can keep uh, keep playing. And in a moment, I'll have a, a prayer and we can, uh, we can be closed the service. But let's take a few moments to just soak in the Lord and let the Lord, let the Lord speak to his and, and do what he wants to do today.